Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Capsigel Dosage Form Solutions webinar um, entitled Biologic Comparison of a Novel Inhaled Insulin DPI Formulation to Exuber. Uh, we're going to discuss capsule and formulation innovation for inhaled dry powders, um, and in addition, uh, highlight uh, a um, partnership between uh, Capsigel Bend and Loveless Respiratory Research Institute. My name is David Bodak, and I'm a Senior Director of Pharmaceutical R&D at Capsigel. I'll be moderating and presenting part of the webinar today, and my colleague, Dr. Philip Kuhl, is a research scientist at Loveless Respiratory Research Institute, will also be presenting and highlighting um, some of the work that was done at Loveless. Over the next uh, 45 minutes, we'll discuss important aspects of formulation process development for an inhaled biotherapeutic highlighting the synergy of our capabilities and provide an overview of a recent case study comparing the inhalation performance of a novel spray-dried powder of insulin to Exubra. We'll then have about 10 minutes or so to answer any questions from the audience. When you have a question, please submit them at any time using the Ask a Question tab on the left of the screen. Feel free to use the tab at any time. If time allows, we'll answer your questions at the end. If not, uh, we will follow up later offline um, so that we're uh, responsive to any and all questions that we get. Uh, finally, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a brief survey. We appreciate um, your participation in, in that as it helps guide um, and make these webinars that we um, have more useful to uh, what people are interested in seeing. Um, so we look forward to your questions, comments, and suggestions. Um, with that, let's, uh, let's get started. So again, here, we're here to highlight a partnership between Capsigel Bend and Loveless, and we're using a case study that was published in AAPS PharmSci Tech in 2014, where we took as a model um, insulin and developed a dry powder and then compared that using some pretty sophisticated, interesting animal models that were developed at Loveless, um, comparing what we developed with uh, what was a commercial uh, product at the time just to uh, kind of show um, similarities. Um, initially, Phil and I will give a brief update on both of uh, Ben Capsigel and Loveless to talk about our capabilities and any, anything new out there and kind of use that to show um, the real synergy of how the two companies are working together to streamline inhaled drug delivery, inhaled drug development. Um, and uh, once we get that out of the way, then we'll dive into the details of the study. And so to get started, uh, we'll just, as the brief update um, and discussion of the capabilities that uh, Capsigel then um, start with, uh, you know, Capsigel Dosage Form Solutions offers a wide range of uh, formulation design, development, and manufacturing options. Today we're going to specifically be talking about the capability and expertise in developing dry powders for inhalation. and. Um, some somewhat around uh, the types of formulations that are amenable to uh, stabilizing biotherapeutics. Um, but just so everyone's aware, we also do quite a bit of work in the areas of bioavailability enhancement, looking at spray dried dispersions, uh, hot melt extrusions, lipid liquid based formulations, and uh, some nano crystal technologies. Um, and then using those and other platforms around multi-particulates for modified and targeted release, which also includes things like taste masking for pediatrics. Um, and, and of course, uh, taking into account how all of those formulations interact with the dosage form and specifically some of the capsule-based options. Um, so again, today we're going to be focusing mostly on um, the dry powders for inhalations area. And when we talk about Capsigel Dosage Form Solutions, it's useful to uh, present a little bit around the business model of where we think we are um, have the most expertise in um, developing uh, drugs with partners. And um, the business model really is to be um, in the specific areas uh, of technology that we have to be um, encompass the entire train of interacting with the client and their target product profile to design, develop, and manufacture into a finished product. And um, that integrated approach with the uh, feedback from the client and the collaboration is really important to us and how that overlays across the different technology platforms. And I think the, um, the relationship that we have with Loveless highlights 
how um, important it is to have the right collaborations in order to enable this. So we'll, the animal models and the expertise that Loveless brings to the table really um, has good synergy with being able to, on the front end, understand what's important about um, the formulation that you're trying to develop. And uh, Phil will uh, take us through that uh, in more detail later. Uh, briefly, a slide to just highlight um, Capsigel's global footprint and where uh, dosage form solutions uh, resides within that global footprint. And um, I'm speaking to you here from our site in Bend, Oregon, um, where we do R&D as well as manufacturing and uh, spray drying. Um, and uh, there are sites across the world, including other sites in Europe and manufacturing sites elsewhere. Um, And now just a, a little bit specifically about uh, the facilities that we have here at the Bend site. Um, and along the lines of the design, develop, manufacture mindset, we're vertically integrated to handle exactly that at each site where we um, perform these functions. And here in Bend, we have R&D labs where we um, have expertise in the physical science, analytical chemistry, um, and uh, you know, essentially, how do, how do we, we develop these formulations and we test them and we um, ensure that they're functioning the way they were intended. We have an engineering R&D plant where we reduce things to practice, so new technologies or formulation concepts get reduced to practice and scaled up. And then we have the, the uh, infrastructure on site on campus where we can do the CGMP manufacturing of those formulations up uh, through phase three clinical trials and now recently this year we'll be announcing the addition of a commercial wing where we'll be able to take those formulations and um, launch the commercial products, um, which is very exciting for us. Um, so given that uh, background of the, the Bend Research uh, sort of infrastructure and dosage form solutions, uh, just maybe say a few words about why we're here on the uh, webinar with uh, uh, our partners at Loveless. And we feel that this is a unique partnership and um, has very uh, beneficial synergies around developing inhaled uh, drug products. And uh, the specific um, aspects to that are, you know, here at Bend, we, we, we are world experts in formulation, manufacturing, encapsulation of dry powders for inhalation drug delivery, and have proven success with small molecules, proteins, peptides, local and systemic treatment. Um, and we'll highlight a few of those case studies here today. And those expertise that David just highlighted from Bend Research are augmented by the, ex by the expertise here at Loveless, as we're the experts in animal models and preclinical drug development. We've got over 100 animal models of disease that include everything from respiratory health to infectious disease. Working specifically with the team at Bend Research, we've got a historical relationship that has resulted in over 15 peer-reviewed publications, abstracts, manuscripts, and presentations. We have a track record of being able to do this all with compound sparing methods in a rapid pathway from hypothesis to proof of concept and to IND enabling if the data in the project warrants. We also have a proven track record of being able to advance these uh, internally as, as our own developments or with different clients in order to meet the needs of different, different types of partners. Exactly, Phil. So uh, yeah, thanks for jumping in there. That's great. Um, okay, so now I'd like to just take a few minutes and, and highlight um, from uh, the Capsigel Bend perspective what, um, what our formulation platform is and uh, how we think about um, developing formulations and designing the process space. And so if we look on uh, this slide, it's is sort of, you know, what we see as the components of a, of a dry powder pulmonary platform technology. And of course, um, you know, the key aspects are there's a product definition and an active. So, you know, what are we trying to treat and what is the molecule that we think gives us the best chance of success? And then, you know, we, we have tools where we look at uh, the formulation um, and based on the compound physical properties, we, we say, okay, what, what's, what's the right type of formulation for this? And um, there's always a component where the guidance for the formulation impact on the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic performance. And that's really where uh, the loveless aspect comes in because we can take these formulations and use their unique uh, differentiated animal models and their uh, expertise to say, if we change this about a formulation, 
um, this is going to be the impact on the PK or PD. And that's really important early on so that you get set with the right uh, formulation, which of course is, is, is a function of the types of materials and excipients um, and the process in terms of, you know, what is, the, what is the morphology and what is the actual active form in, in your formulation. And uh, we'll touch on each of these aspects briefly before um, diving into the case study. And of course, there's always the, the, the piece around, um, you know, characterizing the product and the analytical um, testing and then uh, the capsule-based uh, filling process and, and some device. So an example of how, how we uh, think about formulation development is shown here. And, and typically what we like to do is we like to look at some simple properties that we could measure. So for example, um, when you're spray drying uh, materials, understanding the amorphous uh, state of your active is, is extremely important. And then as we think about you know, how this will behave in the lung or how to, to process it, we also think about things like aqueous uh, or organic solvent for, for, as I said, the processing aspect. Um, and, and this is just you know, two, two parameters of you know, probably an eight parameter model that we could develop, but I think just for today's purposes in terms of demonstrating the thought process, this should be, um, uh, this, this should do nicely. So when we look at, um, uh, you know, here we're showing in this plot the glass transition temperature, Tg, uh, versus the aqueous solubility. And um, if we take that and we plot molecules such as foticasone propionate or albuterol sulfate or even some of the biotherapeutics that, uh, like peptide YY um, and some other compounds that we've interacted with, we look at across this space a diversity of different compound properties. And all of these are things that um, you know, people would have thought of or would like to put in the lung. And so when we spray dry these, we want to understand, okay, how stable is the amorphous state going to be? Um, because if, if the glass transition temperature is very low, the, the chances of being able to stabilize that in terms of it converting to a crystalline structure over time becomes much more challenging. And, um, and then we, we start to use this type of rationale for what types of excipients that may, we may want to use. And we'll also use this rationale for the type of process. So if, if this is going to be really hard to stabilize in the amorphous state, we may use a process that results in crystalline active. And I can speak a little bit more to that in a few minutes. Um, so in the case where we've developed, the, we've looked at the compound properties and we understand, okay, well, either from a formulation stability perspective or uh, from feedback from our team collaboration at Loveless, we say, well, this is, this is fine to be in the amorphous form or no, actually, either for stability or performance perspective, we need to have it in the crystalline form. Um, then we, we take that, we, we think about how to put that into a particle that's respirable, and oftentimes that leads to the need for excipients. And our rationale for the use of excipients center around, you know, either chemical stabilization. So, um, you know, in the case of biotherapeutics, oftentimes, you know, you want the molecule to feel uh, hydrated, good hydrogen bonding, and so we'll select excipients that interact with it there. Uh, physical stabilization, oftentimes if we're trying to augment a lower TG and stabilize the amorphous state, um, we'll add something with a bit higher TG. Um, surface morphology modification, um, putting things in such as, uh, you know, hydrophobic amphiphilic materials that sort of go to the surface of the particle and, um, you know, basically create less of a resistance for particle-particle adhesion and improves dispersibility. And then uh, oftentimes um, these molecules are very potent and we don't need to get um, very much into the lung. And so, but you still need to have enough powder that you can accurately weigh and put into your capsule um, and have come out in a, a reproducible way. And so we, we oftentimes have to put excipients in just in terms of dilution. And in this case, we like to look at the most safe and well-precedented materials. Um, and so that sort of discusses our, our thought process around formulation. And now I'd just like to take a few minutes and um, discuss the spray drying process uh, as a kind of a general overview and, and what are the important things to think about when developing this process with respect to an inhaled, inhalable dry powder formulation. Um, and so initially we have the spray solution. Um, which is going to be defined by the amount of solids that are present. And this also, if we're going to 
um, how, how we present the active to the spray solution will oftentimes determine how it's going to be in the final formulation. So if we dissolve the active in the spray solution, um, in most often that means that we're going to have an amorphous form of the active in the final dry powder. But as I'll talk about in a couple of slides, there are other options here where we can uh, present a, a nano-sized um, active to this in a suspension and then spray dry that for different formulation embodiments. So we, we pump that spray solution through an atomizer. The atomizer um, defines the droplet size, which that in conjunction with the solids in the spray solution will tell you what your particle size is. And then in the dryer, um, the, the extent and the rate at which we evaporate the solvent um, can become important when we think about um, things like spray drying proteins where um, the protein oftentimes will like to go to the air-liquid interface and we may need to compete that off the surface with a surfactant or other type of amphiphilic molecule. And then uh, the, the, the particle size that we're making here is often the types of things in a normal spray drying process, say for oral um, consumption, that would just go through a normal cyclone. And so we've had to do some modifications to our cyclone to be able to enable high efficiency collection of these um, very small, very um, uh, aerosolizable powders. And at the end, we end up with these uh, shriveled raisin looking particles that are in the, the range of one to five microns um, with a very tight span, as you'll see some from the characterization data coming up. And an important aspect of developing a spray drying process, especially when you're dealing with uh, biotherapeutics where the actives can be very expensive and very precious, um, is to not waste a lot of active by running empirical uh, spray drying experiments as you're developing it. So what we have developed are a series of offline tools where being very active sparing or maybe not even using active, we can um, answer a bunch of, uh, answer multiple very important questions about the process as we're developing it so that the first time we um, run to collect powder, uh, we already have uh, high confidence of success that, the, uh, the, that we won't be wasting active. And just to tick through some of these um, offline measurements, uh, we, we have a, uh, a, an offline nozzle test stand where we can um, bring in an, an atomizer, run a spray plume, and evaluate the droplet um, size across that so we know um, right away that that nozzle is going to give us the right um, uh, uh, droplet size to achieve the 1 to 5 micron final dry powder. We also do some hot bench experiments where we look at sort of the thermal constraints of the process so that we don't see browning or baking or cooking of the formulation. And again, we can use really small amounts of active so that we don't do anything silly when we do the full scale run. Um, understanding um, the, the vapor or solvent, water or solvent vapor uptake of the formulation the excipients that you're going to use is, is very important so that we don't end up spray painting the active inside the, the geometry. Um, utilizing the vast experience around spray drying and the thermodynamic operating space, we can define um, reasonable parameters uh, to start with. Um, so again, that we're not um, going in blindly and, and having a, an unexpected incident. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, the cyclone, where we've had to uh, redesign uh, and optimize cyclone geometries specifically to collect these um, small particles uh, with high efficiency. Um, and so that's the spray dry process. And then I'd just like to take a, a minute here and mention up front that um, depending on the active properties and the input that we get from, you know, as, we, as Phil will talk about, some of the um, in vivo studies that we can run, we can decide if we want the active to be amorphous or if we want the active to be um, in a crystalline format. And this just highlights that up front we can do everything from dissolving the API and aqueous organic solvents. We um, we can mix that with a matrix that can stabilize it. We can also do things like nano milling um, or bottom up where we um, manufacture the with precipitation the nano crystal and um, and then all of these options can then be combined. So if we're doing combination therapies where actives may have uh, differences in solubility or incompatible in different solvent systems, we can combine them 
um, in, a, in a mixed approach. And then the point being is that however we generate that, that's all in the spray solution, and then we can still take advantage of all of the um, differentiating and um, improved aspects of the spray drag process to really engineer the particles in a respirable range. And that's all done um, with all the same, uh, there's a lot of synergy there. So what we do with the spray solution up front doesn't impact how the powders perform downstream. And finally, um, a slide here just to, to mention the equipment scales available in Bend. And we, we have um, some really custom-made small-scale equipment that enables um, screening of dry powders in a rapid and high-efficiency way early on. Um, and these are, these are some of the experiments that we'll, we'll mention specifically today with Loveless, where in, in using a very small amount of active and in a very rapid timeline, we can develop uh, a formulation and work with our collaborators at Loveless to say, you know, this is going to function and then use that to scale up to the larger scale where we're, you know, in clinical trial and then eventually commercial launch. So with that, I'd um, like to uh, hand over to uh, Phil to take us through a little bit of the update and the capability discussion for Loveless. Phil? Thanks for that, David. And so, yeah, before I dive into anything on the case study or any of the specifics around it, I'll take a moment to give a little bit of a background on Loveless Respiratory Research Institute. Loveless is a private, not-for-profit respiratory research institute, primarily focused on respiratory cures, causes of disease, and cures. To our knowledge, we are the only private biomedical research facility focused wholly in, in respiratory space. We provide our services to government and industry clients alike. Loveless has two primary campuses, both located in New Mexico, in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our corporate headquarters is located in Albuquerque itself and houses a facility of about 125,000 square feet. If you look back at the previous slide and see that we're focused in the causes and cures of respiratory health, and you, you think about the two relationship, or the relationship between our two campuses, our north campus, as we call it, or our corporate headquarters, is our basic research facility. It's that facility and the group of scientists at that facility that are looking at the causes and understanding the disease within respiratory health. Our south campus is located on Kirtland Air Force Base here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That, that facility houses about 325,000 square feet of labs, and it's that facility where we do more of the applied research. We're looking at after we understand the disease models, how do we intervene in a prophylactic or a therapeutic manner and understand and be able to treat disease, whether it's screening for new compounds or understanding what different changes in environmental exposures might alter a disease state. These two campuses bring together a very diverse range of scientific disciplines required to, to complete these types of studies. As you can see listed on the left, there's a broad range of everything from aerosol scientists, analytical chemists, radiochemists, radiobiologists, immunologists, pathologists, and folks specializing in, in toxicology. All of those disciplines are needed for the, the Loveless team to be able to apply these animal models, to develop them, and be able to support our clients and our partners in understanding their study. One of the important aspects that I think is well highlighted with the case study we'll present and that David has talked about a little bit is the translational nature of the research we do here at Loveless. As I mentioned, we have a group that's largely focused on understanding the basic mechanism of disease, understanding lung disease. We then have teams that work collaborative, collaboratively together to try to develop and implement animal models that mimic that clinical disease so that we can understand the natural history of the disease in an animal model, compare it to what we know about the natural history of a disease in a clinical model, and then develop treatments or, or other models in the preclinical arena that allow us to screen therapeutic uh, compounds. In this case, we'll be talking through with, it with an example on insulin. More importantly, we're then able to work together to take those compounds after we've understood their efficacy to be able to understand their safety and transition back into clinical studies that have real relevance. We have a proven track record of being able to do this in all sorts of different pulmonary disease indications from pulmonary fibrosis, influenza, COPD, and pulmonary hypertension.
As I showed that previous slide, those images make the, uh, the job of going from understanding disease in the clinic, treating it preclinically, and moving back to the clinic look pretty easy. They're, they're bright colored pictures. This slide is one of my favorite slides, and it really shows what, why we need that diverse range of everything from aerosol scientists to toxicologists to be able to make those bridges. These are lung casts of different species that, that Loveless has research working with. If you look at the human on the right, all the way down to the mouse on the left. Those pictures should show the different complexity of the aerosol and, and the, the quality of the formulation that we need in order to, to deliver an aerosol across different preclinical species and have the ability for that formulation to have meaning when we move back to the clinical setting, hopefully as the efficacy data and the safety data warrant. So it's working across that continuum, that continuum with good partners like Bend Research and being able to generate those formulations that really enable the success of any program, as I said, as you move from that preclinical space back into the clinic. The current study that we're going to talk about today that David and I will go into some detail on is a case study where we looked at a, a product that at the current time was marketed, inhaled insulin in the form of Exubra, and a formulation that the Bend Research team spray dried and developed that we'll call a Dextran 10 inhalation formulation of insulin. The goal in this model was to look at the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of orally inhaled insulin. Specifically, we wanted to compare and contrast both of those. Once we had the data, we looked at modeling the arterial blood insulin concentration with standard pharmacokinetic methods using Win non lin to try to see if there were differences or if we had formulations that were essentially equivalent. So now I'll hand it back to David to go ahead and talk through some of the technologies that his team utilized to make a formulation that enabled this case study and, and this preclinical study here with our teams at Loveless. Great. Thanks, Phil. Um, that's really interesting. I, I, too, really enjoy that slide with the lung cast. It's amazing. Um, so now just to take a few minutes here briefly, because the, the real interesting thing here is, is going to be, as Phil takes you through, sort of how this dry powder interacts with the, uh, the biology and the, the models that Loveless came up with to kind of demonstrate that. So I'll just take a few minutes here and highlight what we made and, and, and how we characterized it. But it essentially, uh, as Phil mentioned, for this specific study that's in the um, PharmSci Tech Journal, uh, we were looking at um, higher molecular weight polymers with hydrogen bonding sites to help stabilize the insulin and also give a, a really high performing product because of the high glass transition temperature avoided adhesion between the particles. And we were able to do this uh, very rapidly with a, a very small amount of API. Um, and we, we started with our uh, customized Ben Lab Dryer, which as mentioned in a previous slide, sort of spans the scales from uh, about 200 milligrams of powder up to, um, you know, hundreds of grams. And, of course, that depends on how much solid you can dissolve in your um, uh, spray solution. But effectively, the purpose here was to, to make and collect particles that were around a, a mass median aerodynamic diameter of 2 to 2.5 with a, a GSD value on an impaction test of 2 or less. And um, using all the tools that um, I mentioned on a previous slide, we uh, mapped out a, a process space and then used that to select these conditions. So um, here, we'll just just highlight going through the drying gas flow rate, atomization, feed rate, um, the solid floating, which is about two weight percent, um, and then the inlet temperature, which seems high for a biotherapeutic, but actually because of the evaporative cooling that happens right away. Uh, the product really only sees the outlet temperature, which is around 55 degrees C. And um, as discussed in the paper, which we don't have time necessarily to go in here, um, the 55 degree in those process conditions were selected because we knew and had measured the glass transition temperature of the dextran much, much, much higher than that, um, even at the relative saturation of the dryer here, which I think was around 4 to 6 percent relative humidity. And um, so that outlet temperature was such that it's much, much lower than the glass transition temperature of the product we were making, which means that we wouldn't have issues with sticking of the product, uh, but also that um, the dry powder was uh, essentially frozen and not mobile, meaning that we, we felt confident that that would hold the insulin in place at 
elevated temperatures and not allow for any sort of uh, uh, chemical degradation or unfolding. Um, and then in this case, we were looking at approximate uh, batch size of about 7 grams and at this small scale getting a yield of 70 percent, which um, typically as we scale these formulations up, we start to get higher into the 80 and even 90 percent yield. And um, we, did, we did perform using uh, Malvern dry powder method, um, a geometric particle size, and showed that um, we were getting about 2.6 micron uh, particle size. Um, uh, and so when we, we tested this material, um, and here we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the methodology. So we, we looked at uh, dry powder impaction, and the way these tests are run is about 10 milligrams of powder is put into a Capsigel VCAPS Plus special grade for inhalation, which means uh, uh, it's an HPMC capsule, so it, it, it excels at the lower uh, relative humidity storage conditions that are required for these typically for these uh, inhaled dried powders, um, meaning that we really like to store these at less than 10% relative humidity, which for gelatin-based capsules is not an acceptable condition. You get cracking and brittleness. Um, the VCAPS Plus uh, inhalation grade also has a specific and lower, um, very small amount of lubricant, which um, enables uh, or, or basically enables dry powder formulations because you don't have the excessive lubricants that interacts with the dry powder and causes um, powder hang up in the in the capsule body. Um, and so that, that capsule, these were filled into those those capsules which were then put into the off-the-shelf uh, Plastiapi monodose inhaler um, and then fired into an NGI at kind of standard conditions which are listed in the fine print below. And as I said, this has all been published and it's all in the uh, uh, the paper, if, if anybody would like more detail, they can find it there. Um, and so what we found was, um, you know, as we expected, um, a high emitted dose, the fine particle fraction less than 4.6 microns was very high. Um, the, uh, the calculated dose delivery of the lung was very high, and we achieved sort of our 2, two micron um, mass median aerodynamic diameter and geometric standard deviation. And then, you know, this was work that was done here at Ben to make sure that we weren't sending to level with anything that we didn't think um, Phil and his team could handle in terms of the animal model. And then once at Loveless, they, um, with their aerosolization methods that were more appropriate for the model, Phil will talk about, they confirmed these results. Um, we also like to look at dynamic vapor sorption and how that relates to the glass transition temperature. Um, and this is to, used to define the storage condition because if we take on too much water, we're going to have stability issues both with particle-particle agglomeration as well as enabling mobility of the active in the particle, which can um, allow for unfolding or even um, aggregation in the dry powder state. So we use this to define the storage conditions. And we typically like to be um, less than 3 weight percent water, um, and so we use that to, to define, you know, how the less than 10 percent RH. And then this is just a, a, a beautiful scanning electron microscopy image here showing the really shriveled um, High, high surface area, low contact point of the spray drag powder, which means less contact between the particles means less van der Waals interaction and higher dispersibility for a, a, a well-performing dry powder product. And uh, you know, this, this slide was just a, a point to say that um, you know, in this paper we had evaluated Dextran 10 as a superior performing excipient, but um, it's not precedented and um, you know the safety does need to be demonstrated out. So we have also shown that you can develop these formulations at different loadings with the same process platform by substituting the dextran 10 out with a smaller molecular weight sugar that's um, you know a bit more precedented in the industry and showing you know effectively uh, a, a well-performing product. Okay, and with that, I think that's a, that's a good summary for the dry powder that was sent to Loveless, and now um, we'll, we'll let Phil take over here and uh, tell us what they did with that dry powder. So thanks, Phil. And so thanks for that, David. And, and David did a great job of describing what uh, his teams will do to develop a dry powder for inhalation. And as he described, you know, a lot of the methods that he detailed apply more to a clinical setting. And in another webinar, on another day, and another presentation, we can go over how a patient will take that device and that formulation, and quite frankly, they'll, they'll use it sometimes correctly and sometimes incorrectly. Let's assume for right now that we wanted to do a preclinical model off of how a patient would use it correctly. 
in general, a dry powder device is something that a patient should be trained how to use. During that training, they should be taught how to do a nice, calm, controlled inhalation over between one and three seconds that fills the lungs completely. Immediately following that, they should do generally a 10-second breath hold, followed by a calm exhalation. Whether or not people are successful at doing that, again, like I said, that's another story. But as we roll that over to a preclinical model, whether that's a, a large animal or a small animal, the ability to teach one of those preclinical animals to do a nice controlled inhalation, get them to do a breath hold, or a nice calm exhalation is difficult at best. So what I'd like to start out with talking about is, is how the team at Loveless many years ago, in fact working on Exubra, developed methods to be able to try to mimic a clinical maneuver so we could take well-engineered dry powder formulations like the material that Bend Research develops and be able to transition them into a clinically relevant preclinical model. In doing that, we developed a system here at Loveless that we've called the dry powder bolus delivery system. If you look at the image on the right, this system consists of a dry powder reservoir, an expansion holding chamber, and an, endo, an endotracheal tube, and the force maneuver that we perform is actually performed with a positive ventilation bag and an ambi bag, just like you would see it in a clinical setting. In this model for the animals, we anesthetize them with topical isofluorine. After they're anesthetized, we intubate them with an endotracheal tube. Following that, we induce apnea by overventilating the dogs between 10 and 15 times. And for those of you that aren't toxicologists in background, what this does is this over-oxygenates the animals. So the animal's internal regulation system that determines how often they need to breathe stops. So the animals are no longer breathing. This allows us and, and the teams here at Loveless to be able to breathe for the animals. In doing this, we aerosolize the material from the dry powder reservoir into the holding chamber. Immediately after we deliver that aerosol into the holding chamber. We do a forced maneuver to the dog that is not breathing on its own and deliver that aerosol to their breath, to their lungs, followed by about a three-second breath hold. While we can't get a perfect, perfect clinical maneuver with this, there are some subtle differences, this maneuver allows us the best opportunity to take well-engineered materials and do a clinical-type maneuver to these animals. So not unlike what, what David and the Bend Research team did in terms of in vitro testing, the team here at Loveless received the Exuber materials and the Bend Research spray-dried insulin material, and we had to work through our in vitro characterization to make sure that our results matched what the Bend, Res Bend Research results uh, were, and then we are able to transition those over to the in vivo side of the, of the testing. Two of the major points that we look at in terms of the, this particular delivery system, we look at the efficiency of the material to be ejected from the reservoir, and we look at the efficiency of the material to be delivered to the terminus of the endotracheal tube. We also look at particle size throughout this model. And in doing this work, we look at a range of different loadings and some subtle different variations on the delivery technique in order to optimize that delivery efficiency. And you can see here in this table, we were able to to develop a pretty high, highly efficient system to deliver this material both out of the dry powder reservoir and to the terminus of the endotracheal tube for that material to be, pre, to be presented to the dog's lungs. We'll, get, we'll go through and talk about it in a little bit, but our goal here was also to match the dose of insulin, knowing that there, that there were different blend percentages within the formulations, but to match that delivery of insulin to the terminus of the endotracheal tube so we had a, a good PKPD study. So with regards to this specific model, it should be noted that all of these tests were performed under the Loveless Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. That's our IACO committee. Many people use that as short. And that we're an ALAC accredited facility. So all of these procedures were performed according to those procedures. This particular model requires a, a surgical implement, implementation of an arterial catheter prior to the model. So we used our, our veterinary surgeons to implement that, allow the animals to recover. And then on the day of the study, we implement catheters, intravenous catheters, for glucose infusion 
and for, in order to maintain euglycemia within the dogs. This study was done as a four-animal crossover study with two animals receiving each formulation on each day, so it was a full crossover. Within this study, immediately following the inhalation, we collect 14 serial samples of, of the blood to look at, of arterial blood, to look at insulin, C-peptide, and blood glucose. Within the model, we utilize somatostatin to suppress endogenous glucose production, and then we infuse a constant rate of glucose to maintain euglycemia within the animals so that we can completely understand it and, and appreciate when we do our data analysis that the insulin we're quantifying and that we're modeling in our pharmacokinetics was from the oral inhalation from the Venn research material and or the exubera material that was delivered via the inhalation maneuver. So the first thing we always want to look at when we look at one of these studies is what dose did you actually deliver? So for the dose delivery in, these, in this study, these were all normalized to individual animal body weights taken immediately before the doses. You can see we gave the exact same dose of insulin from each of these products. That enables us to be able to read through the data that I'll present in a little bit, and like David has mentioned, it's presented in the manuscript. So we're starting from the same foundation in terms of delivered insulin dose. The first data point we look at is C-peptide. C-peptide is a measurement of endogenous, in, uh, endogenous insulin secretion. So if we have suppressed endogenous insulin through somatostatin, we should see these drop very rapidly and stay at or near the limit of detection of our assay throughout the duration of the study. As you can see on the graph on the right, this is exactly what we saw for both formulations on both days of this crossover study. That allows us to read through the data, and, and as I said earlier, we're able to ensure that the insulin we're quantifying in the arterial plasma really came from the oral inhalation from the, the dry powder formulations. Because of that, we're then able to look at this graph. We're able to look at the graph on the right, which is the arterial plasma concentration of insulin for each formulation as a function of time. So you can see both of these follow apparent first-order elimination. And I think more importantly is that you see that the, how quickly the material was absorbed into the systemic plasma and how, and, and how high the Cmax and the Tmax for both of these appear to be very, very close. And we'll get through some of the modeling in a little bit. The other thing that I think should be noted is if you look at these graphs, it does appear that the, the Bend Research Dextran 10 insulin material appears to have an increased insulin concentration from about 30 to 35 minutes to maybe about 90 or 100 minutes later. We evaluated the statistics on this, and while it does look like there's a trend there, that was not determined to be, to be statistically relevant. The next thing we look at is we look at our blood glucose and our infusion rates to make sure that those were similar across all the animals and across all the formulations. So as we maintain euglycemia, as you can see in the top graph, our arterial blood glucose levels are constant, and the infusion rate required to achieve that was not statistically different. And then we get into the pharmacokinetic modeling. So as you see here in this table, probably the, the most important part of the pharmacokinetic mod modeling is the Tmax, the time at which the maximum concentration is achieved we're very close for these two formulations, with a Tmax of 14 minutes for Exubra and 20 minutes for the Dextran 10 insulin formulation. Coupled with that is what's called the Cmax, the maximum concentration achieved in the systemic plasma. As you can see from the table, they're both at about 120, 125 microunits per mil, meaning that the, the speed that each of these formulations were absorbed and the completeness were very similar in terms of how quickly they were absorbed. That speaks to the quality of the formulations and the similarity between the formulations in this inhalation delivery and that they were likely deposited very, nice, very homogeneously throughout the lungs of these animals. Reflecting back on that concentration time profile for the arterial plasma insulin, if you remember I talked about the fact that the dextran formulation, the Bend Research formulation, had a slight tendency 
to an increased concentration throughout those middle time points. That's also reflected in the area under the curve, as you see on the bottom line of the table. You see a little bit of a tendency for the, the AUC to be higher for the dextran formulation when compared to the exubra. However, as I noted earlier, that was determined not to be statistically significant. So with regards to this specific case study, this shows the ability of Loveless and Bend Research to work together to assess, in this case it was a proof of concept formulation, in a PKPD model where Bend Research was able to develop a novel engineered spray dried form, spray powder or spray dried inhalation formulation and hand that off to Loveless. We were then able to move that into an in vivo PKPD model in dogs and evaluate the bioequivalent or the equivalence of these compounds in the PKPD model, looking at both some PD endpoints and some of the PK modeling. And I should mention that this has been published in a recent AAPS uh, journal in a, an issue focused on inhalation formulation with guest editors that, that had several other issues, fo articles focused in this area. As we transition away from that topic a little bit on that particular case study, it's important to note that, the, as I mentioned earlier, that Loveless and Bend have had several other examples that have been published in the literature of our ability to work together. Now I'd like to go through a couple of those examples and talk about some other different compounds and different disease models that we have been able to show these synergies in. The first one utilized a small molecule in a dog model of bronchoconstriction. In this model, we looked at PK and PD. Our PK, time point, our PK data are shown in the table on the left. For this particular material, this was an albuterol dry powder and an albuterol nebulizer. And you can see that the Tmax and Cmax are very close between those two formulations, and the half-life is very close. As important was the pharmacodynamic readout, which is a measurement of bronchoconstriction. With each of those bars, the closer each of those bars are to 100%, that means that the formulation completely stopped bronchoconstriction in this animal model. This has been well published and has been, this particular da uh, data set was published in Farm Research as shown in the, uh, the reference on the bottom of this slide if you have any other further questions or would like to look at it more. But this, like I said, this showed the synergies of Bend and Loveless in a small molecule for local delivery in bronchoconstriction to the lungs in a dog model. Another example that we'd like to touch on is an example of a PKPD model that we did in rodents for a systemic indication. This indication was appetite suppression. In this model, we utilized pharmacokinetics following delivery by interperitoneal injection, subcutaneous injection, and inhalation delivery to model the systemic pharmacokinetics and compare what we determined to be an equivalent formulation. So on the left, you can see that following a dose of 0.1 mg per kg by IP, or sub-Q, we see similar systemic pharmacokinetics. Through the different doses and different modeling of the pharmacokinetics following inhalation, we determined that a dose of 0.2 mg per kg by inhalation resulted in similar systemic pharmacokinetics. So our hypothesis was then that if we moved that dose over to the efficacy model, model of appetite suppression, we would see similar pharmacodynamics. And as you see in that graph on the right, the dose of 0.2 mg per kg by inhalation showed similar efficacy in this appetite suppression model. These data are in press right now in drug development and industrial pharmacy, and I would encourage anyone, encourage anyone who would like to, to to grab that article and review this more in detail. A final example that the Loveless and Bend Research teams have worked together on was a small molecule that we did a PK assessment for a lung cancer treatment model. In this, in this method, we used a novel technology by Bend Research where they actually made a nanocrystalline material for Loveless to use in a rodent PK model. We were using this, these data to look at bronchial alveolar lavage, fluid concentrations, lung tissue, concentrations and systemic plasma concentrations following IV delivery of canthothecan and two different inhalation 
doses of the, of the novel dry powder for inhalation. Our goal here was to show similar exposures in the lung tissue while reducing systemic exposure with the goal of being able to transition this into an efficacy model where we could utilize in the same manner as we showed with PYY with the previous compound to be able to show the differences between the dose that you would need to use to see similar concentrations for efficacy. Hopefully as we transition that through, we'll be able to show some efficacy data. And last, I think we should note a couple of things that the Bend Research and Loveless team have that they're working on currently that hope to have publications on coming in the near future. One is a PKPD model where we use a small molecule to assess the differences in formulation. Many of the things that David described earlier that his team has the capability of modulating and controlling and seeing what their impact have on systemic PK and, and, and acute pharmacodynamics in a large animal model. And also we have some work going on with a small molecule in order to assess its, its efficacy in an inhalation delivery for lung cancer. So with that, I'd like to transition it back to David, who will inquire and hopefully be able to address some questions and be able to wrap up our webinar today. Okay, great. That concludes our presentation. Uh, I see that we have several questions, so let me get started with the first question. Um, and the question is, could you please explain stability of the engineered powder? And um, that's a, a, a really big question, and we could probably have an entire webinar um, solely on that aspect. But um, when we talk about stability of the engineered powder, typically because we're using the spray-dried process, what that means is we're going to have amorphous material. And there are two aspects to the physical stability of that. Um, uh, one aspect is, you know, the state of the <clears throat> active. So if we've made the active in an amorphous form, um, we want to keep it amorphous. And um, and then the second aspect is we've made these, you know, elegant small two micron particles um, because we want them to get into the lung and we want to make sure that they stay at the two micron particle size on storage. And both of those aspects are going to be um, handled by thinking about the, the, the glass transition temperature of the matrix material um, or the surface material of the, uh, the particle. So uh, in, a, in a really short summary of that question, um, and happy to talk more offline about it, um, uh, the glass transition temperature of the material is going to be very important. And that's, uh, that's going to be a function of the material you choose as well as your storage condition in terms of the relative humidity. Um, so hopefully I uh, answered that question sufficiently. The, let's let's look at another one. Um, okay, here, how much material is required to complete a PKPD assessment similar to what is shown? Um, Phil, would you uh, like to answer that? Yeah, David, thanks. I think that's one that I can take. So in general, one of the most important, there are two real things that contribute to the material needs for one of these studies. Those two things are the efficiency of the delivery system. That, that speaks to the delivery system itself and to the quality of the material that's being delivered. The other thing that, that contributes significantly to the amount of material required is the target dose. So if you refer back to the slide that I presented with regards to the dose delivered to the lungs of these animals, we're at a 0.12 mg per kg dose. For this program, this entire program, the aerosol development, the testing and the actual animal dosing, this program required between 50 and 100 milligrams of material to conduct all of it. So obviously based on the different, and sorry, what I should have said is this was a fairly efficient powder when you looked at the delivery efficiency presented to the end of, uh, end of the endotracheal tube and to the amount of material that was ejected from the dry powder reservoir. Because of that, our material needs were relatively low. As you can imagine, if you increase the dose significantly, there, there can be some increases in the amount of materials consumed and needed to perform these studies. OK, great. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, the next question is says, uh, I noticed that Tmax for Exubera was substantially faster in your model than in actual clinical use. Is that typical of your model? Um, Phil? So with regards to, to the, to the Tmax differences between the clinical model and the, uh, the preclinical model, we haven't specifically looked at, or I, I can't say that I specifically have looked at the differences between what is seen in the clinic 
versus our model. What could contribute to those things could be the differences in the inhalation maneuver. There could also be differences in the deposition pattern within the lungs. As you can imagine, there's variability around each of the different uh, maneuvers, as I talked about, and there's, there's differences in the, uh, the lung itself. The other thing that would, could contribute to some of those, I, I don't know the studies specifically, but you might want to look at what blood sampling time points. If you go back to the time points that we selected in, in this study, we're pretty heavily weighted on the front end in and around that 5 to 35 to 40 minutes to try to capture that. So it's important to also look at those if you look at both the, the clinical study and the preclinical study and making those comparisons. However, most of these materials, the dry powder materials that Exuber itself and that Ben Research have used, as David mentioned, they're largely amorphous materials, which provides an opportunity for pretty rapid absorption, resulting in fairly quick Tmaxes and pretty high Cmaxes when we look at systemic availability. Okay, excellent. Um, Looks like we have time for maybe uh, one more question, um, and uh, we'll follow up with other questions if we don't get to them off offline. So the last question is, on the powder engineering, why did you choose to use trehalose instead of inhalation-grade lactose, which is the standard for DPIs? Um, and uh, the answer for this one is fairly simple. Um, in the case of insulin, we have um, some free primary amines um, uh, or, and some secondary amines that um, we didn't want to have interaction with. Um, uh, in terms of a reducing sugar and have a browning reaction. And so for oftentimes for biotherapeutics, um, you're s sort of forced to, to use a, a non-lactose excipient. Um, and trehalose is a, uh, um, a reasonable um, substitute for that. So, um, so that, that's all the, those are all the questions we have time for today. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to contact us directly via email. And as I said earlier, we will, questions that weren't, we weren't able to answer in the timing of this webinar, we'll get back to um, offline over email. Um, we do plan to host additional webinars on our array of proprietary technologies and hope you'll continue to participate. Our next webinar will be held on June 3rd and we'll cover our biotherapeutic formulation and processing capabilities. Please check the Capsigel or Bender Search website for details and uh, to register. On behalf of Capsigel Dosage Form Solutions and uh, Loveless Respiratory Research Institute and, and you, uh, Phil, Dr. Cole, I'd like to thank uh, you, uh, everyone for joining us today. Please fill out the survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as the webinar is over. Um, your feedback will be incorporated in a future webinar plan to make sure that we're continuing to have material that's of interest and relevant to um, the audience. Um, and please contact us at the email address given if you have any questions or comments, and we will follow up. Thanks again for your time and attendance today, and hope everyone has a good rest of their week.